and I suppose I'll just start by saying thanks very much to Glenn for joining us today and sharing some of his experiences and insights with um, a couple of key areas like IPM, um, improving uh, application methods for plant protection products, looking at resistance, um, biological products and the marketplace. Um, so Glenn, I, I was just reading up in your biography. So you're, you've been with Syngenta for in the your current role for about two or three years and you've been working in horticulture for over 25 years by yeah. the looks of it. Yep. Very good. Um, and where, where are you normally based in the UK? So I am um, our, our team office is in Cambridge uh, but I personally am based down in Winchester near Southampton um, generally pre all of this the as well this world we live in I, I was on the road four days a week so my role was very much out in the field talking to people and mixing with people but that has changed significantly the last six months mm -hmm. okay so okay so um we'll get underway um so i'm gonna say uh, glenn thanks very much for joining us i am um, i suppose when myself and glenn were, were chatting about um subjects to cover looking more at kind of autumn and plant health and uh, maybe improved efficiencies um glenn was kind of keen to move towards maybe the higher level looking at an, an overview of uh, some of the plant health topics so we've got there looking at um, IPM application of uh, plant protection products resistance um, biological products and market impact so we'll cover that for about 30 minutes and then have uh, some questions and answers after that okay um, a little bit of housekeeping before we go on you'll see that the the meetings being recorded and it'll be posted up afterwards in the coming days on the Chagas website your, the audience is muted um, and your cameras are turned off, so we'll, we'll keep that um, going for the rest of the meeting, if that's okay, just to protect uh, the bandwidth and uh, hopefully it'll all work out smoothly. If you want, you can post any questions um, during the meeting um, with the, the chat function or the, the Q&A, and then we'll have a, a discussion after the presentation as well. So um, that's the the way it'll shape up and um i glenn i'll hand over to you if you like and i'll let you take over from here thank you very much thanks and you'll need so, to un you know unshare yeah there we go all right let me just share my screen with you So hopefully you'll have a, a picture of some nice sunflowers in front of you now. Yep, Give us a yep, thumbs great. up. There you go. Perfect. Right. Thank you, everyone, for joining me um, and joining us. Um, Donna asked me if I could come and do something along these lines. Um, what's going on? Why is my computer not moving? There we go. Great. Is that still with you? Perfect. Um, yep. So... I just wanted to talk to you a little bit and use this opportunity to talk you through some of the things that are going on in the industry. Um, my role has changed a little bit over the last six months. Um, I was on the road uh, most of the time talking to customers, talking about their problems, helping them out, getting involved, learning, and just being that conduit between Syngenta and the customer. Now, the last six months have changed that significantly and I've been working from the office a lot more. Um, so a little bit of background about me. Um, I am the technical manager for UK and Ireland for the Syngenta Professional Solutions business. Now, the professional solutions business is fairly wide ranging and we'll touch on that in a little bit. And um, ornamental controls takes up a small area of that. Uh, I've been with Syngenta for around two and a half years. 
And before that, I was uh, 26 years managing sports turf. Um, but that all came from a horticultural foundation. I studied horticulture at Sparshall College, uh, went through and did my national diploma in that, and that evolved into sports turf. So my sports turf is very much my expertise in the area I've focused on for the last 25 years. There is a foundation understanding of horticulture, but it's really important, I think, to point out that I am not experienced in the field. I'm not a crop walker. I'm not an agronomist. What I offer is a quite a practical conduit between the grower and a whole host of people with a massive information to them. And you'll see in the last six months, there's been a we've been spending a lot more time blogging and com digitally communicating with the world. And that comes from me being able to reach into various pockets and grab information and turn it into something that should be quite useful for the customer. If you want some advice on what does botrytis look like in cyclamen, then I'm really not the person to talk to. But if you want to understand the implications of longer term legislation on how things are going to pan out for you, that's where I have a quite unique overall view on what is going on. And what I've done today is I've put a presentation together with a whole host of areas to look at. And I'm going to try and just fill time with a very kind of strategic view of what's going on in the industry and how some of these things can help. And I'm going to try and keep going because I could talk for hours on a lot of this stuff until about 3.30, which gives us about 25 minutes now um, of information, kind of higher level stuff about what's going on. And then if you want to drill in with some questions, far away. I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to have the answers. But what I'm more than happy to do is take those questions and then bring them back in another presentation for you at a later date. More than happy to organise that with Donna. So I'm going to start with who are Syngenta? What are we? What do we do? And how large are we? Well, we are a massive agricultural agrochemical company and this slide is now out of date it says here we've got 28,000 employees in some 90 countries that has now increased to around 49,000 in the last few months there's been acquisitions and mergers and the company has almost doubled in size now so we are now the world's biggest agrochemical company um, at the stage that this slide was put together we were investing over 1.3 billion in research and development that was 2018 with over 5,000 research and development staff. When you start looking at the amount of work that is going on at this higher level, the research and development that goes on into what's going to happen in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the line is huge. Um, and 2018, I think they did around 13 and a half billion pounds worth in sales. So you start to see the size of a company like Syngenta and the ability they have to make an impact. And so we've got two core businesses. We've got crop protection, um, which is very close to what we're dealing with now and what we're talking about. And that's mainly selective herbicides non-selective herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, seed care, and then professional solutions, which is the team that I fit into in the UK. And we'll touch a little bit on that in a minute. And then you have a separate side of the business, which is seeds. So you've got a whole range of things going on over there. Whilst we do have communication, there's not a lot. So I'm not going to pretend to know anything about the seed size of the business. I sit in that small professional solution side in crop protection. But we've got nine strategic crops that we focus on, corn, field crops, rice, professional solutions, again, that's me, speciality crops, cereals, soybeans, vegetables, sugarcane, a very wide range as a business we're looking at. And then we've got six key areas that we focus on. Again, we're looking at weed control, fungal growth, insect control, nematode control, abiotic stresses and yield and quality. So we, when you start adding all of that up together and you look at all the stuff that's going on, you start to see the scale of the business. Something else that is going on at the moment, we've recently purchased um, and acquired a company called Velagro. Velagro are a biostimulants company. That's gone on only in the last couple of weeks. We don't know how it's going to pan out yet. But what it really does do is show Syngenta's commitment to the biostimulant and the biological market. So I'm starting to get, we're starting to get our head around how we invest in that area and what it has to offer. Um, 
I'll come back to that one at the end. The thing I'd like to start with when I'm talking about all of these challenges is a concept called exponential growth. Um, a lot of you will be very familiar with exponential growth in recent times. When I used to teach this pre-COVID, exponential growth was a concept that not a lot of people had got their heads around. Um, with these graphs showing up every day, and these are today's figures, I think, seven-day average of 18,000, starts to demonstrate the power of exponential growth. And when we're looking at any kind of disease management, pest management, understanding exponential growth is key to knowing how to get the best out of this whole program. So bear with me if you've got a full grip of what exponential growth means, um, but it is this foundation building block for the rest of the presentation. So we're going to do a little exercise here. And what I'd like you all to do is grab a pen and paper if it's next to you. And I would like to make you, a you to make a firm decision about whether you would like me to give you one P today and double it for a whole month, or would you take five million pounds as an upfront sum? So have a little think about that for a second. I'm gonna offer you one P and double that one pence every day for a whole month, or would you take five million pounds? Now, if we're all face-to-face, -face, I'd get you to go to a different side of the room and really stick to your commitment, but I'm just gonna to have to trust you. But if you were to make that decision and you would think about it, on day seven, if you took the one P option, so if you doubled that every day, you would have 64 pence in your pocket or you'd have five million pounds available to you. By the time you get to day 17, that one P is only equated to six, uh, 655 pounds compared to the five million still. So if you were saying you were gonna take the one P and doubled, you would probably start to lose confidence at about this stage. So by the day you get to day 22, you'd be up to nearly 21,000 pounds or 5 million, still starting to question whether that was the right thing to do or not. But quite quickly, that ramps up. And by the time you get up to day 29, so if you did it in February, you should have already taken the 5 million. If you did it in a 30-day month, you'd be 5.5 million did it on a 31 day month, you'd be nearly 11 million pounds by doubling that 1p every day. Now, that just starts to show you the power of an exponential growth in those last periods. When these things start doubling, 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 that power really ramps up. And you see graphs like this with exponential growth. Now, when I was showing this pre-COVID, nobody had really understood this concept. They hadn't seen this massive rise like this, this double, 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 and things escape. But now we're seeing these on a daily basis. I think people are starting to grab this concept. And understanding this does have a real impact on how you manage some of the problems that you get in these glass house environments or even out in the field. Because these problems start small and they double and they double. If the continue, conditions are correct for them to keep growing, then that problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it explodes. And you probably won't see the problem until it's exploded. So a lot of the things you're gonna be trying to do in the future are about managing this exponential growth early to keep reduction down and not waiting till you see the problem, which is when it becomes very difficult to manage because you need what we traditionally have supplied, which are kind of one punch knockout type products, we've got to move much more into managing at lower periods. So the reason I open with that is because that is a key concept to understand when you're looking at your integrated management strategies, when you're looking at how you can start managing um, your crops and your plants in a better way. Now, IPM is a phrase that has probably been banded around a lot, and you've probably heard it God knows how many times, and you probably have a view in your own head about what IPM means. But I think it's always worth revisiting it, because I think when I talk to people, they all say they have an integrated strategy, but actually, they're skipping a lot of the steps in here. Also really, this is also really important for resistance management as well, because this is where resistant management starts. And when Donna asked me to put this presentation together, it was kind of a focus on resistance, but actually I think these are really good practices to start with. 
So prevention, where does prevention start? This foundation base for good management, whether this be um, autumn diseases, whether this be insects, um, whatever it is, this prevention foundation is critical. Um, and in that prevention category, I look to start with things like resistant cultivars, using plants that are resistant to the diseases you're particularly prone in your area, improving plant health and cleanliness. Um, cleanliness is really important. There's loads of data on this. Doing a really good job on kind of glass house structure and machinery equipment, cleaning and disinfecting that on a regular basis. Um, being very conscious of what you're doing, taking machinery from dirty area to clean areas, um, containers, storing them under cover or shrink wrapping them outside. There's a whole host of things we can do there. Growing media, looking at how you store loose media in better areas or on concrete slabs, just being really conscious of keeping these things clean, because this is all about at that very base of that exponential growth curve. This is where it starts. The more you can reduce it at that early phase, the smaller the problem is down the line. Um, plants, good inspection of plants, um, incoming young plants, checking them for pests, weeds, diseases, and monitoring growth crops and checking for them regularly. Everything you can do to keep that population low early is important. Uh, bench standing and growing areas, keeping them clean and disinfecting. Um, ensuring ground covers are flush. There's a whole load of things here. Good standard practices, things that can be easily missed when you're firefighting. If you're firefighting the big problems, then you tend to miss these small ones and then it grows on you quicker and you get caught in that firefighting cycle. And there's a little bit on water in there as well about maintaining good weed control around reservoirs and stopping seed blowing into them, relevant for weeds as well as diseases. Um, and some other bits and pieces on non-cropped areas and waste cropped areas. But the point here is, because I'm going to try and squeeze this into 30 minutes, is good hygiene is critical, particularly for these diseases, which all fall into this kind of autumn period, root rots, bacterial wilts, botrytis, frits, vine weevil. Good hygiene goes a long way to starting this process. Monitoring is the next stage in this platform. Um, crop walking, regular crop walking, really important here. Digital is something that is improving massively as time goes on. I've got a little bit of a far grow presentation in here. Sticky traps for insects for monitoring. But looking at digital technology, the ability to get sensors into crops now. Far grow, who are one of our distributors, are doing a great job on um working with 30 megahertz at the moment to develop these sensors i would really recommend you talk to these people about the technology they've got it's not something we're investing in but it's something that they are um, just this ability to get sensors into the field so this information can go between growers to advisors all of that jump back into r d to try and make better decisions these early sensors this early sensing of data, temperatures, humidity, climate, all of that goes a long way to building this next platform on that IPM strategy. And with that data, we've got, we're much better equipped to use the next phase, which is kind of biopesticides, and when we can understand the conditions that they will work in, we're in a much better position to kind of see results growers are getting and the environmental conditions they actually have in their area. Um, we're in a much better position to understand macrobiological controls, which have really specific conditions in which they can feed. And then these IPM system becomes, in, but it becomes increasingly complicated and that needs managing. Um, so talk to a professional about these kind of things, these kind of digital sensors, so you understand. But that becomes the future. And a lot of the things we've got to do to keep pressure lower is at this bottom foundation of this IPM triangle. We then move into physical and mechanical methods, mattings, mulches, um, all that kind of stuff. And then we start looking at the next phase, which is where we start to get involved at Syngenta, these biological controls, biostimulants, anything biological that is deemed to be a little bit greener and a little bit safer. Excuse me. Um, and this becomes really important to understand and start looking at 
Because this tier is going to become increasingly important. The chemical bit at the top, that bottle to reach for when you get a problem is under increasing regulatory pressure. The demands to get products registered are getting higher and higher. The research and development needed to get these products safe enough to be used becoming more and more demanding. Yet there is more investment going on in biologicals than there is in chemistry to start developing these new products. So this tier of biologicals is going to become increasingly important. And then we reach for the chemical. Now the chemical should always be this last protocol. It is that product that can be used when that peak of damage is there. It's all about managing it and reducing that exponential curve. But once you start getting up towards the peak, which is where the problems are seen, that's when it becomes really important. And for both chemical and biological products, it's really important to apply them correctly. Now, this is an area that I've focused on quite a lot. Um, and I've just got a few tips for you today about how to get the best out of your products. One of the difficult things about the industry you're in is you have such a wide range of plants that you're dealing with. And they change in shape and size so quickly through the period of their life. It's really hard to give any kind of one piece of advice that will help you, that will give you a definitive answer. I'm much easier and it's much better to kind of teach concepts and look at how those concepts work and allow you to adapt things to how you work. So I start with calibration and checks. Uh, I go and visit a lot of places and I see a lot of sprayers, a spray rig set like this. Um, I think there is probably more maintenance that could be done on these than is actually being done. They're really important. And the first place I would start with is pressure gauges. Pressure gauges are incredibly important to ensuring you get the right output of your nozzle and your nozzle size and your droplet sizes are correct. If these things are giving you incorrect readings, then you are going to struggle to recreate applications consistently and in a good manner. And that's something a lot, a lot of people are aware of is once these things get ramped up to high pressure and they stretch that spring that's inside, their calibration is shot and done. So I would get these things calibrated and checked. And I would also get one fitted at your lance end of any spray hose because the difference between where this, non, this pressure gauge is on the spray tank and the pressure you're getting at your boom is significantly different. But the kind of things I'd look to go for and check on a regular basis are hoses, triggers, lances, connections, seals, pressure gauges, nozzles, filters, lids, and look for leaks. There are a number of things there that I think, and from experience, tend to get overlooked more often than they should. To get your sprayer set up right, that is the place to start. And there's some really nice checklists on the NSTS website and well worth downloading, giving someone in your team to get out there and have a look at on a regular basis. So we then go and have a look at water volume. Water volume is something that can make a huge difference. Um, the higher that water volume, the more chance you have of increasing that runoff and you're diluting that product further and further. The advantage is that it is a safer product. There is a um, less chance of seeing any phyto issues with it, phyto damage. Um, however, when you start reducing that volume, you get a lot more of that product on the leaf. You get a lot less in the soil and you get much better efficacy out of it because the product is less diluted. So when you're thinking about water volume, it's worth more attention than I think most people give it. So as a rule of thumb, if you've got something like this, um, this cord line down here, um, then water volume should probably be a lot lower. You've got a lot of leaf there and things are going to run off. So in that situation, in this bottom right corner, I'd be looking to really reduce water volume if you're trying to apply something that is taken up by that leaf. Whereas in this situation, we've got a bit of soil exposed and we've got quite a bit of leaf. 
So you want to be looking for water volumes much closer to the middle, um, something that is going to be more effective because you're getting down into a dense canopy, uh, but you're stopping things running off to water. This is all assuming you're trying to hit that leaf. Whereas when you go to this one, you're going to want much higher water volumes because you've got a much denser leaf canopy there and the soil is really difficult to, to hit. So you want to get down into that canopy, you want a covering leaf, but it's very difficult to get things down to the ground. So you need to think about what it is you're applying and what water volume you want to be applying to. Really difficult to make any recommendations because there is such a wide range of plants and products that you want to be applying to. So the next thing I then start thinking about is pressure. Um, what pressure do you want that to be set at? Go to the nozzle chart to start with. Um, if you've got a nozzle on your boom, if you're using something like that, have a look at that nozzle chart and really think about it. Um, although they'll give you a wider range as really optimum on those nozzle charts, nozzle charts are horrible things. Some of them are quite good. Others will give you a huge range that they're effective in. But the thing you want to be really aware of is the higher the pressure, the finer the droplets. The lower the pressure, the coarser the droplets. Um, higher pressure is often mistaken for better penetration, and that's really not the case. Once you get into these finer droplets, they will repel much easier. They will float in the atmosphere much more. Coarser droplets will penetrate the plant much better than a finer one ever will. Fine droplets will repel and lift, they'll evaporate, they'll be inhaled. None of that is good. Bad practice to be at high pressures. Coarse droplets are much more likely to run off. So you've got to think that through. And in my head, it always comes back to this graph. The pressure is a bit random there because it's they're all general, but the lower the pressure, or sorry, the higher the pressure, the better the spray pattern but the higher the pressure, the worse that drift is. The higher the pressure, the more the leaf runoff, but the higher the pressure, the more deposition you have on that leaf. So you need to look for this optimum pressure range. There is a wide range in there of things that you can go to, but you, there'll be an optimum for what you're trying to achieve. Knowing your target, Really important concept because you can't adjust your water volume and your pressure without knowing what you're trying to achieve. In this situation, are you trying to hit the leaf or the soil? Well, hitting the leaf in this situation is really easy, but if you want to penetrate and get good coverage on that leaf, much trickier. If you want to hit the soil, you've got some big problems. Whereas if you look at this one, this one is quite easy to achieve both. We've got a dense canopy, but we can access most of it. Soil, however, that's quite easy, but we want to be making sure we don't get any runoff. But then we look at this situation, and whilst the leaf is there and it's exposed and it's really easy to access, huge amounts of runoff on here is possible. So you've got to be looking at a much finer droplet in order to stick something to that leaf. However, soil, that's really simple to achieve. So I can't give you any specifics for the crop you're trying to hit or the products you're trying to, to use but what I can say is take your time and think about the impact that those things have. There are a number of challenges and you look at what's going on here with this guy spraying in the background he has a number of different crops going on that he's probably spraying with the same product um, and that is why conscious compromise is something really important to understand. Know your target of your leaf, uh, know your target, sorry, soil or leaf. Use your pressure to your advantage. Um, so many people I see use just one pressure set at a regular basis. It's not getting the best out of your products, it's really not. And as we go further down this line of using less products, getting more out of them is really important. Use water volume to your advantage as well. Um, think about that canopy density you've got. One of the things I do recommend is people get some water sensitive paper to learn. Um, if you've not seen water sensitive paper, it's this stuff, they're small yellow strips, but when you get some moisture on, they turn blue and you can stick them in amongst your crop at various heights to just see what deposition you are getting at different areas. And when you do it, you start to see a huge difference. You'll see a difference from lance to nozzles to water pressure. And it will start training you and teaching you how to get the very best out of these products. Now, I make that point because it's 
uh, really important. Um, sorry, bear with me. There we go, back to that one. It's really important because we want to be getting, bear with me a second. we want to be getting the very best out of the IPM triangle using those products in the right way at the right time is really important so when you apply those biologicals or those biostimulants all those chemicals getting the very best out of it at the right time is critical because if you think about this exponential growth chart that we've got down here when we start using these biologicals things are ramping up and we want to be getting the best out of the products that are available to us um so i'm going to do a quick bit on resistance uh so resistance donna asked me to talk a bit about resistance and um i think the best way to understand it is just to understand it from a strategic point of view what is the value why does resistance occur and what is the value of taking this seriously this diagram is the simplest way that i found to explain it if you look at what we've got going on here, we've got a number of bugs on one leaf um, and we've got one that has created or generated this kind of genetic change somehow. So this one bug is resistant to whatever product that is, is being used to deal with that. So assuming that application number one of that product goes on, we wipe everything out except that one bug that has become resistant. Now, I'm using insects in this simple diagram but this could be pathogens this could be fungal spores this could be anything everything will genetically modify slightly over time so what's happening then is that one guy that's been left because that one application of that product didn't affect it is generating more so he is creating more offspring so we've got more genetically evolved species in there that are resistant to whatever that application is. Now, assuming you go in that next application with that same type of product, we're still not dealing with those guys. And the cycle gets bigger. So assuming you keep going back with that same product, this population will grow until we reach a point where it's no longer effective. And this is where I tend to get involved. People will pick up the phone or the distributor will get on the phone and say, with these products just no longer working for us, Glenn, what can we do? Um, and that's where I get involved at that stage, which is why I kind of understand this process. Now, the key to resistance management is taking that back and rather than applying this product here, is applying a different form that is going to attack and wipe those uh, resistant species out so we take it back to square one this is something that's been talked about for years and darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is exactly what's going on here but we are fast forwarding it in a glass house environment um, darwin talks about how species will evolve over time and it's survival of the fittest and survival of the strongest and they will evolve into the next species and it just keeps moving forward he loved the Galapagos Islands because that was a great example of a kind of glasshouse environment where nothing could get on and nothing could get out. And if you look at the glasshouse environment that a lot of you will be working in or are working in, it is exactly the same. So resistance management is really important because you have this whole evolution of species going on and you are fast forwarding that evolutionary process by wiping species out with products. Rotation is the key to this, um, rotating products on a regular basis so that you can get control of it. Whilst good resistance management plans start with great hygiene and all of those platforms and those bits at the beginning, ultimately, when you get to those high peak levels, this is all about rotating the products you are using, whether that be rotating among bio biological products, um, chemistry products, different modes of action, rotation is the key and i am not completely okay with all of the products there are in the market i'm very familiar with our products but we are not the only manufacturer of chemistry there is a whole range of this stuff out there go and have a look on the frac websites and use that there's a whole load of classes in there there is plenty of options to rotate things they are becoming more and more limited we've got a load of information on our website 
go and take a look at that and that will help you out as well. Um, very conscious of the time, it's 3.35. Uh, I'm going to do a quick bit on our advice hub. A lot of the stuff I talk about, I, I've learned it through picking people's brains, putting some research together, and all of that goes into this advice hub that is on our website. Um, this is probably more intelligent than I am. Um, there's a whole load of information on resistant management tools in there that are well worth reading. Uh, a lot more in-depth stuff on the art of application than I've touched on today. Uh, we are currently working on a podcast. I'm not sure the podcast is a working title. I think that has been um, hijacked by some, uh, some fella in California who likes to smoke a lot. Um, so that is on its way. Um, and my advisory blog is on there with loads of kind of summary articles on this kind of stuff. Well worth a look at if you've got time. Um, Donald, it's 36 minutes past. Do you want me to do a bit on biologicals or would you like to roll into 10 minutes of questions? Oh, that would be a great one to run a poll on and see what people wanted. Um, I, I've just got two questions there. So um, maybe I, I think we might have time for a, a little bit on biologicals if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Do you want me to run through that now? Yeah, 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 why not? Let's do that. Okay, Thanks. so Thanks very much. no problem. Biologicals are going to play an increasing role in this whole IPM strategy. Now, if you look at the IPM triangle, we're always advise people for biologicals before chemistry. It's about keeping things in the plant health. Now, biologicals are a really interesting thing. And as a company, we are fully invested into developing um, more tools for you to use to support chemistry. Uh, so what I'm going to quick look at here is just what regulations and how they're changing. Very few of the different types and something on the upcoming regulations. Um, so what do we got here? The current regulations are quite great is the simplest way to put it. We've got two sets of regs that determine what's going on in UK and Ireland. We've got plant protection regulations which covers fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, biocontrols, interestingly. So don't let anyone confuse you on that. But if it's biological and it is stated to claim a disease, uh, if it's stated to control a disease or a pest, it is a biocontrol and therefore falls under the plant protection regulations and nematicides. And then you have the fertilizer regulations, which were put together in 1991. They cover crop nutrition, fertilizers, soil improvers, and substrates. And then you've got this big hole in the middle. This big hole in the middle is full of all sorts of crop enhancement type products. Um, acids, microbials, extracts, other, and they generally get termed up as this kind of biostimulant type title. Now, the fertilizer regulations that are supposed to be in place in 2022 are designed to tighten this area up. And they're going to tighten it up for a number of reasons. There's a lot of um, poor communication about this middle ground. There's a lot of false claims about this middle ground. And there's a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of products being sold that just haven't had the level of work done on them. So if we look at how that breaks out, we've got these kind of other areas between these two. Now, the kind of things you might have heard of are humus or humic acids beneficial elements, mycorrhiza, trichoderma, other beneficial fungi, seaweeds, kelps, phosphites, amino acids, fulvic acids, cytokinins, chitosan, I'm seeing a lot of that floating around in some other industries at the moment, and a whole load more. Now, the thing is with this gray area in the middle at the moment is these can be sold with any claims on them that people wish with very little supporting data or evidence to support it. Very little in the way of research goes on. And what I generally see is people, even some of the responsible ones, people taking a, a research article from 10 years ago claiming that X biological does something in a crop 
then rather than being specifically researched for the market that it's going into, that information just gets rolled out. And the new EU regs are designed to kind of control that and, and improve it. So what are biostimulants? The simplest way to understand how biostimulants are going to be once the EU FERT regs are in 2022 are they are not to protect plants from pathogens or pests, and they are not for providing nutrition. If they're not one of those, they are a biostimulant. And therefore, under the new regulations, there are only four things you can say about those EU fertilizer or those biostimulants. You can either claim they have nutrient use efficiencies, you can claim they have improved the availability of confined nutrients, they improve crop quality traits, or they improve the tolerance to abiotic stresses. Now, what does that actually mean? So as a claim of a product, something along the lines on um, improved nutrients in the soil or rice sphere would be, it will, um, oh, I've got that one wrong. I pulled that from the wrong slide. Anyway, biological fixation of nitrogen or solubilization of phosphorus would be something. Nutrient use efficiency would be the plant pulling phosphorus in in a more improved way. Um, forgive me, these two are the wrong way around, but tolerance to abiotic stresses would be these ones here, salt stress, drought stress, heat stresses. A crop quality traits would be something like flower size increase or improved root mass or improved storage development. There is nothing in these areas about saying you can improve disease tolerance. It will make your plant more resistant to this pest. If it claims any of those, then it is a biocontrol and falls under a different set of regulations. But I think here's the thing I was trying to reach in this presentation today is why are these biostimulants growing? Why is this market going to improve, increase? Well, the regulatory pressure on traditional chemistry is huge. Um, it is taking years to get products developed now to be safe enough to be registered. And even once we've been developed, getting them through registration so they can be used is incredibly difficult. We've got some products that have been in regulation for four years now. Um, there's an increased desire to use greener solutions. The public are definitely after greener solutions. They don't understand what that means, but they know they want greener solutions. There is an increase in the frequency of adverse environmental conditions. We are seeing higher temperatures in the summer. We are seeing milder temperatures through the winter. We are seeing higher humidity. Climate change is definitely manifesting itself and causing us problems. Um, so we need more tools to help deal with that because the chemistry armory is shrinking and the pressure is getting higher. So we need more tools and biostimulants and biological products are there to help. Um, synthetic chemicals are needing to be reduced as well. Really important to do so, but that has an impact too. We're seeing these EU regulations tightening up as well, all leading to an increased availability of innovative products due to more investment. So if we look at how this biological market is being forecasted to grow at the moment, um, 2018, it was around uh, 1.9 billion globally in biostimulants. Um, we're seeing, well, we're predicting that's going to be around 6.4 billion by 2030. This biological market is going to increase um, and mainly in that biostimulant area because the biostimulants are easier ones to develop and there is less regulatory pressure because there aren't claims that it will do things to pests and diseases is about crop health. So there's less barriers to entry in this biostimulant market. And that's why you're gonna see that rise almost exponentially over the next decade. You can also see the investment in research as well, a quick search on Google Scholar on um, published biostimulant articles by year shows that, you know, we've seen a couple of peaks in there. Again, I feel like I'm presenting another COVID graph here, but we really didn't see any significant research in biostimulants until around 2010, 2011. And then at that stage, it started ramping up. Those people who had some foresight were investing time and money in research into biostimulant. And now we're kind of reaching 2020. We are up at around 3,000 published articles a year on biostimulants. There is a real investment in this area in the moment. There are some big gaps. 
climatic pressure is getting higher, the chemical armory is getting smaller. These are the products that are going to fill those gaps. And there's Dan Lightfoot, our UK business manager, uh, my line manager, who's very happy about this, just saying how committed we are as a company to invest here. And I showed you this little bit about Vallagro earlier. We're showing our commitment to this area by investing in biostimulant companies, because whilst we can do some of that work, by investing in experts and people that are out there, we can kind of leverage our, our research and development and work with these companies. But the key thing is these products are going to be critical to improving plant health, making things really resistant and getting us in a stronger position. Now, these are going to work at that lower levels of exponential growth. If we wait till we're at the peak of that exponential growth, when we're seeing these problems, these type of products aren't going to have the impact to improve plant health enough to resist. And one of the products we're launching, the first biostimulant we're launching is a product called High Cure. It'll be coming soon. It's an amino acid. I'm going to rush through this a little bit, but an amino acid. This is the kind of simplicity and clarity we are going to try and bring to the market with biostimulants. Amino acids are the final breakdown of proteins. So when plants break down, and die and they degrade and when animals die and degrade the amino acid is the final part of that cycle it is the smallest breakdown of that high cure is an amino acid product which has been designed to deliver those amino acids to the plant in their most broken down form which is saving the plant this biological energy because as soon as the plant goes into a stress period it starts breaking down to try and create these amino acids. And we've got some science diagrams there about the process. Amino acids is the smallest building block of a protein, the largest part being the protein. A plant wants to break its proteins down to create amino acids because amino acids will help the plant in a stressful situation. Uh, it's just a graph to show how high cure is broken down. But to explain how those EU regs work, um, Hycure is a brilliant product that we've seen some really good value in improving plant health, which will help a plant resist disease. However, it is not a biocontrol. It will not kill or solve that disease. What it will allow you to do is improve these crop quality traits. So we can't say that it helps with disease. What we can tell you is that it improves the quality of the plant. So in this situation, you're going to see crop quality traits such as increased root mass, increased flowering, longer shelf life. They are results of using high cure. And there is an increased tolerance to abiotic stress by reducing the amount of heat stress and by creating these amino acids the plant needs to cope with that, it will be in a stronger position. So you will see these results. But what we can't go and do is tell you that it deals with X disease because it doesn't. And that has to be supported by data now. Um, so when the EU regs are in place, all of the claims that will be made will have to be supported by data. And here's an example of the kind of data that we've done on Hycure because we're trying to be 2022 regulation ready. Um, so quick conclusion, um, biostimulants regulations are tightening. If you make any claims about protecting plants from pathogens or pests, it will fall into plant, play, plant protection regulations not biostimulants. Um, you can only make certain claims under these new regs. Um, the key thing though is as biostimulants come to the market in the future, the company should have and must have invested in supporting any claims um, by doing research. This will only work if you guys start asking to see this research. We are fully committed to doing this properly. We want to be major players in this biostimulant market because we recognize its place in plant um, in this management. We aim to keep it simple, science-based and clear. And we're on that journey already. Um, hopefully, I, everyone is still awake and I've managed to turn a 30-minute presentation into 50 minutes. Um, so have I escaped question time, Donald? Oh, uh, I think we will just about have time for a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, Glenn, thank you very much. I, I know that that was a whistle stop tour across a lot of very broad areas oh. and some really interesting insights into 
um, different areas of the business and how maybe nurseries can improve some of their, their operations. I'll just skip to some of the questions, if, uh, if that's okay. The first one came in there about um, spraying and water quality. Um, yeah. How important is it um, in terms of application and efficacy? Um, okay, so I'm going to put my um, technical manager for Syngenta a hat on right now. All Syngenta products that are formulated are formulated to cope with a range of water quality issues. Uh, products that we sell will be formulated and created to work around the world. So the same product will get sold in Canada as it will in the United Arab Emirates. Um, so we have to deal with a range of water qualities. Um, and we have a in-depth team of formulation scientists that work on all of this stuff before they're released. So what I can say is with a Syngenta product, um, you may need to add adjuvants in order to get it to stick to the right area of the leaf. But as far as water quality goes, all of that is built into it. Um, there are other products on the market that are not formulated anywhere near as well. And it can have an issue um, with a poorly formulated product. Okay, um, and I guess it's it's really down to the product um, more than the water quality. Yeah, again, it's about um, having a faith in the product you're buying, understanding how much work has been done on that, um, and we do a lot of work on formulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, fogging has a you talked about a, I suppose pressure and application. How do you see fogging fitting into um, pesticide application? I think probably the biologicals might see a, a growth in that area. Or, or yeah, it's an interesting area. one. Um, I, like I say, my background isn't in a glasshouse environment. Um, I have some experience going in and seeing people. When I talk to the internal team about Syngenta, about any of those kind of low water volume fogging type applications, they're really not supporters of it. Um, I have never really got to the bottom of why, but a water volume seems to be required. A lot of the data we create is on traditional application methods. Um, that there is definitely a resistance at our end to adopt that kind of technology. I haven't got to the bottom of why it's one of the things that is on my list to research to get a much better understanding. And I'd love to come back and talk to you about what I find. But um, there is a certainly a, an investment and a commitment from the industry to use this technology. But yet from the manufacturer side of it, there doesn't seem to be the same levels of support. OK, that's, that's interesting. Um, there's a couple of... Uh, questions there have come in on very specific issues um so yeah. one there about leather jackets as being a big autumn issue in lawns and turf grass so maybe okay. it's something yeah. it is you're, you're quite familiar with yeah um, that one inside out and backwards any uh, comments on control particularly with nematodes or, or chemistry um so nematodes nematodes do work i think is number one to go with nematodes um they do work when they are applied in the right conditions. Um, they present some challenges like all of these live biological type products do. Um, increasingly, it's worth getting our head around those things and committing the time and effort to understand the life cycles and the way to store these products and the way to apply them. Um, mm -hmm. That is the future for me. The future is all about these technologies are going to be harder and harder to use. So commit the time to learning to get the best out of them. Having said that, nematodes are tricky to get right. Um, there is a product on the market called Aceleprin, which is one of our products that has an emergency authorization in um, various sports turf and airfields. Uh, we're working on a full registration on that. Um, but outside of those two things, there is, a non, there is a real gap there. And this is what we're seeing develop because there's increasing regulatory pressure on products. And um, the research is slow on this biological type stuff. There is a gap increasing and it's like the thin end of the wedge. I think we're going to see it more and more. And in leather jackets, we're seeing that at the moment. Um, the advice I can give you outside of leather jacket control is 
keep turf in the best condition you can or keep it growing because you've just got a picture there is a there is a hungry grub at the bottom of that eating root mass you've got to try and replace it quicker than it's being Mm -hmm. disposed of and it's a perfect example of just where the challenges are now with regulatory pressure okay um and thanks for for that um i'll try and be quick with these ones as well for you i have a very specific question downy mildew um it sounds like they're they're at the the peak of the curve um i was too late to prevent it so it's spread to all the plants they are now looking pretty bad what would be my best option now um yeah. And again, this is where that's, that's I'm very specific. Pretend, yeah. yeah, I'm not going to pretend to be the expert here. Talk to your agronomist, talk to your crop walker, talk to your distributor. They're in a much better position to um, talk about that kind of thing than I am. Uh, that that person can contact me directly. I won't name them, um, but you can contact me directly, and uh, I'll try and help you out. I am. Um, I have a, another question on high cure. Um, can you give an example of? Um, Ornamental plants or species where high cure is showing effect as a biostimulant. Um, and you were saying you were that you are good at you would like to be sharing lots of the research data. So is there data available on that? And there's another question there about um research papers um and maybe some named biostimulants that are available. So I guess high cure fits into that branch. Yeah, so high cure is being launched soon. Um, I haven't got an exact date for you. Uh, we've got loads of work on roses, um, a lot of cut flowers. We've seen big, big advantages in that in cut flowers and shelf life once cut flowers have been put out. Um, I don't have that data to hand, but when we launch that product, we'll be launching it with a, a data pack as well. So um, that, that's the thing to ask for is look for these biostimulants, look for these products and actually ask for the data and the research behind it. Um, because they should, these companies should be doing it now. Okay, and is is High Cure the main product um, on the horizon for biostimulants, or do you have other ones that are currently available? So we have, uh, so, yeah. Now I'm involved in this side of the industry. I start to understand the true meaning of the word pipeline. There are a whole load of products in the pipeline. Um, how many of them fall away before they come to product launch is a different question, but with the Villagro um, acquisition, that pipeline just gets stronger. So High Cure is the first of what I suspect will be a series of biostimulants that you'll see from Syngenta and other manufacturers. We won't be alone. Uh -huh. Okay. So they, I, I think we might be going to the end. So it's nice to finish on a positive note to think that there are options being presented to us in the coming years. And it sounds like the, the numbers are growing. I can see you mentioned things like... Um, basic substances there in the list, you know, Kytosan and um, other products like that. So some of those are already out there and should fit into part of that uh, control program that people are thinking of, right? There will be specific places where they can work for people. So yeah, some of that, this is here. That, that's exactly it. It's understanding what do these things do? And where is the best place to pro place them in programs? And I, I think that is the bit that, um, is the exciting bit for me over the next decade and there will be some pain along the way but I, I genuinely think if we're sat here in 2030 having a conversation we will be in a much better place with a much safer range of products that are better for the environment and better for us and better for our crops and we'll be developing great crops on the back of it we, we may have some hiccups and some pain along the way but it's a really exciting period to be involved in this industry I think Great. Um, well, Glenn, I'd like to say thank you very much on behalf of all the people uh, participating and, and watching. Um, it's been really interesting to see um, some of the activities and uh, some of the things coming online. So we look forward to seeing more of them. And thanks again for your offer to support us uh, again, maybe in the future. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to wrap up by saying thanks to everyone for attending and participating. Um, and thanks for your questions. We have another event coming up in a couple of weeks, right? maybe in two weeks' time, with Damcon, uh, Lean, uh, Shewater, who um, they manufacture uh, tree harvesting equipment, will be discussing with us uh, mechanical weeding and some innovations from their line. So uh, that'll be our next session coming up soon. So I, I'll just stay, I'll leave it at that and say thanks very much, and I hope everyone keeps safe and talk to you all again soon.
Okay. So thanks very much. Thanks, Glenn. Okay. Thanks, everyone.